Well, shalom everyone again. This is part two of the previous teaching. Uh, Nathan Lawrence, Natan Lawrence, Hoshana Rabah. And um, we're going to talk about what the science fiction writers and the quote-unquote prophets have predicted in the last uh, 170 years. We could go back further than that. In fact, actually, I'm going to go back 230 years. I'm going to show you something here. It's been hidden in plain sight right in front of us since the very founding of the United States of America. And you all are carrying it around with you on your person, the evidence of it, if you have a purse or a billfold. And it has passed through your hands thousands of times, the evidence of what I'm speaking about. Some of you know where I'm going with this. And this is something that the original science fiction writer, and I put the word fiction in quotes, John, the disciple of Yeshua, John the Revelator, predicted in Revelation, especially chapters 13, 17, and 18, I have here in front of me a $1 bill. On the back of the $1 bill, and a lot of you know this already. Some of you, this will come as, as, as a new. I'm trying to get it on the camera here. Right there. You see the great seal of the United States of America. Look it up on Wikipedia. It was adopted as a seal of the U.S. government and of America in 1789. 140 some years ago or so. Okay? The back of that seal, and you all have seen this a thousand times, maybe more than that, is the is a a pyramid. It doesn't come up too well on Zoom, but those of you on YouTube can see this and you see a pyramid and on top of the pyramid is an eye with rays of light coming out it's called the eye of Horus and there's a lot of debate about where that came from but this all-seeing eye of Horus Make no mistake about it, that's the eye of Lucifer, the light bringer. It's a Masonic symbol. If you go back and read Albert Pike, who was lived during the time of the middle to during the 1800s, he was a Confederate um, army commander in the Civil U.S. Civil War, and he was the one um, the the head of. Freemasonry, the Scottish Rite Freemasonry in North America, and and then he wrote the book Morals and Dogma, which I had a copy of that until I threw it away in the garbage a couple years ago. But that symbol is in there as a Masonic symbol. And it goes back to the ancient pyramids and the, the Luciferian religions of the Canaanites and of the ancient Babylonians and, and in Egypt and so forth. But that's not what I want to draw your attention to. I want to draw your attention to the Latin words underneath it. I don't read Latin, but I know what this one means. Pull it out and you see the words on a banner underneath the all-seeing of Lucifer on the back of the great seal of the United States of America. Novus Ordo Seclorum. What do you think that means? It can mean several things in Latin, but one of its interpretations is New World Order. Well, people will say, well, that was what the Founding Fathers envisioned for the United States. And they're, they're correct. But the United States is not the world. It's one nation. They had a much bigger vision in mind 
than the United Nations, uh, than the United States. That was a Freudian slip. <laughs> and you can see where we're going with this. And this whole idea of a new world order was was started. You know, it goes way back. It goes back to the Tower of Babel. It goes back to the the you know pre um, flood world. It goes back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and Satan, the the one the, the counterfeit, the one who came to to counterfeit and to destroy the order that Yovah Elohim, the Creator, the God of the Bible, established when He made men and women in His own image. We're not going to go all the way back there. We've discussed this in the past. We're just going to take it from 1776, which is when Adam Weishaupt, a Bavarian um, ideologue and intellectual, founded the Order of the Illuminati. Now, their goal was to overthrow the um, monarchies and the, and the ruling elite of their day in Europe. Well, the Bavarian aristocracy found out about it and made the Illuminati illegal. You can go read this on Wikipedia. You can go read it, you know, it's an in the encyclopedia. And oh, exactly history. And it and and it drove it underground and it infiltrated the um Freemasonry in France, and that led to the um French Revolution in 1789. And that was the first um, overthrow of a monarchy in Europe. And then you had Napoleon come along, and he went through and did his thing in the early 1800s. And that was the aftermath of the French Revolution. And the French Revolution happened a few years after the American Revolution. And... It was a very different kind of revolution. And I'm not going to get in. I've studied the French Revolution quite extensively. Um, French is my second language. And I've been in France and I've studied these things quite a bit. Um, and then in 1848, we had, as a result of the French Revolution... We had the revolution of 1848 that swept through Europe and it deposed the government in France and it had far ranging um, implications in Europe for dis dis establishing or destablish, destabilizing the old world order. But it didn't go far enough. But in 1848, a Jewish man by the name of Karl Marx, who had renounced his Jewish heritage, or Jewish religious heritage, published the Communist Manifesto. Now, Marx had connections with the Rothschilds. He was, he was, um, he was a, I, I researched this out, but he was a cousin or something of the Rothschilds, which were the banking family of of um, Europe, and they're the ones that finance both sides of the Napoleonic Wars, and Nathan Mayer Rothschild, who was in England, there was a branch of that family in France, in Italy, in Germany, in Austria and Germany, and in London, four brothers, uh, and their father was um, Mayer Amschel Rothschild, and they came out of um, Germany, but they were bankers, and Nathan Mayer Rothschild and his his brothers on the continent became very wealthy, financing both sides of the war. And a lot of you know this story. And eventually, the he became so big that he the bank he actually gained up gained control of the Bank of England, and so he became the lenders to the British monarchy and the um, British Empire. He became very wealthy. They were wealthier than kings. Anyway, we're talking early 1800s here. Um, I don't want to get bogged down in those deal details, but I want to come up to Karl Marx, who was um, connected to the Rothschilds and to this whole idea of overthrowing 
the established order of things, the monarchies. And so Karl Marx came up with what we call the ten, what what he what was called the ten planks of the Communist uh, Manifesto. And I'm going to read through these very quickly. This is where I gave you all this background to bring you to this point. And see, and I'm going to go through a little timeline here and show you and bring you up to the future to show you how what we see going on today, much of this was prophesied in the Bible and the things we see happening today in the world have been planned deliberately by the bankers, the educators, the politicians, the government leaders, the 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 elite, if you will. Remember, we're the deplorables. This has been planned for a long time. And as I have been saying for a, a while, these are all steps. The devil is trying to establish his new world order, what the Bible calls Mystery Babylon the Great. And that's the Antichrist system that will exist at the end of the age that will oppress, tribulate against, kill, martyr the saints. And that's what Yeshua is coming back to destroy. We know how the end of the book is. That is our joy and that is our hope. And we must never take our eyes off of that. But in the meantime, in the meantime, we don't want to be ignorant of his devices. To be forewarned is to be forearmed. To be bury one's head in the sand is to be ill-prepared and is living in a fool's paradise. And that kind of paradise is only for fools. People say, well, ignorance is bliss. I just soon not know about this. I'm going to live my little life in my little, you know, I don't want my apple cart to be upset. To which I respond, ignorance is not bliss. Ignorance is ignorance. We're going to go through this very quickly. Karl Marx, 10 Planks of the Communist Manifesto. Abolition of prop number one, abolition of all property in land and application of all rents of land to public purposes. You say, well, I still own my property. Oh, really? Don't pay your property taxes for about three years and see what happens. Who really owns your property then? Can you do with your property what you want? Or do you have to get all kinds of government permission, codes, zoning, ordinances? Can they come and confiscate your property whenever they want and call it eminent domain or call it this and that? And I could go on and on. Are there all kinds of regulations? You better believe it. And we're talking about in free America. That's all happened in the last few decades. Number two, a heavy progressive or graduated income tax. That came to the United States in 1913 called the Federal Reserve Act. Oh, it was only going to be started to, to tax the very wealthy, 3%. Now we pay 50, 40 to 50% of our entire income in taxes of all kinds. State, federal, local fees, you know, value-added taxes, excise taxes, gas taxes, you name it. Yeah. Number three, abolition of all rights of inheritance. Okay, you can still pass a certain amount on to your kids if you die, but if it's over a certain amount, the government, both state and federal in this country, take a good chunk of it. Uh, two years and four or five months ago, my wife's father died. He was an investor. He had a little bit of money to leave to his daughters. We haven't gotten our inheritance yet. It's been tied up in government red tape. But we found out that there was a little bit more money than what we thought. And the executor informed us that now this is going to kick 
my father-in-law's estate up to a higher tax level, and now a whole bunch, a whole big chunk of it's going to go to the government after taxes were already paid on it. And it's getting worse. It's not getting better. Number five, centralization of all credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with state capital and exclusive monopoly. That's called the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve System. It is not federal. It is owned by private banks. And it is the one that prints the money or the U.S. Treasury prints the money, but it's the one that regulates the money and the New York Federal Reserve controls the, the um, banking of the United States and basically between New York City and the City of London, the financial center of London, the whole, the finances of the world are controlled. Make no mistake about it. Russia, China, all the rest of them are under the thumb of the international bankers. Nothing happens without the control and the permission of the people that make the money and loan the money. Number seven, extent, extension of factories and instruments of production owned by the state, bringing the, into cultivation of wastelands and impro improvements of the soil generated generally in accordance with common plan. So this has happened. I can only speak about America, and I think we have more freedom than most countries, so it's probably worse than other countries. But this means that the government, while they may not own the land outright, they own most of the land in the United States called the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest, U.S. Forestry Service. And what land they do not control, they control or outright own. They control what you can and can't do with your land. And then they, through government regulations, they tell you what you can develop, what you can't. If you can drill for oil or if you can't, you can put a pipeline, you can mine, you can whatever. All these regulations. So you really don't own your land. And as a business owner for 37 years, I can't do everything I want in my business. I have to have all kinds of regulations. I'm not saying it's all bad. Some of it's good. But all kinds of regulations with regard to my employees, what I do, what I don't do. There's so much government red tape that we have to go through. Just in the last 37 years, it's gotten a lot worse since I've been in business. So the government controls a lot of what we can and can't do. Number eight, equal obligations of all to work and establishment of industries, industrial armies, especially for agriculture. So this is trade unionism, trade unionism or trade unions. Um, this is all, all kinds of, again, government requirements, government mandates, government regulations, regulating all kinds of things. So it's basically state control and it's getting more and more and worse and worse. We call it government overreach. <laughs> Number nine, combination of agriculture with manufacturing industries, gradual abolition of the distinction between town and country by a more equitable distribution of population over the country. So this here is the, again, um, big agribusiness in conjunction with government, controlling people, um, the agglomeration of people into central locations where they can be controlled, um, and they call it equal distribution. So public welfare systems, giving to the have-nots, helping those people that don't want to work, giving them assistance, um, people that can, can't can work or refuse to work, you know, government handouts. I mean, the social welfare system, which came up under Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Lyndon Johnson has been getting, you know, his great society, the New Deal under Roosevelt. Again, more and more wealth redistribution, and it's made more poor people rather than uh, um, wealthy people. You, you do have the wealthy elite, but there's more poor people um, living on government assistance than ever before. Um, number 10, free education for all children in government schools and abolition of children, children factory labor in its present form. Combination of education with industrial production. So, yeah, um, I, I know I'm not against child labor. The, the prohibition of child labor in factories. That was a horrific thing in the 1800s. But this free education, and this is something that the Bernie Sanders type people love to tout. Oh, free education, free education. Guys, it's not free education, it's free indoctrination. 
We're all for education, teaching people to read, write, reading, writing, and arithmetic. But when you indoctrinate your kids in, 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 in these philosophies, now you are brainwashing an entire generation to accept socialism, to accept government control, to accept um, handouts from the government, to, to accept that you know, you're entitled and you don't really need to work that hard and, and you know, accept living in a controlled society where their, their civil liberties are being taken away and, and just becoming a controlled people, okay? Each one of these we could break down into a lot more, but I'm not going to get into that. So... In 1921, well, we had World War One. I. I, I've talked about this. I'm not going to go there, but basically, World War War World, World War One um, was the abolition of four empires: the Russian Empire, the German Empire. German Empire wasn't very big. The Austro-Hungarian Empire, which compared controlled a lot of Central Europe, and then the uh, um, Ottoman Empire, which controlled a lot of the Middle East. It was the destruction of those four empires which is exactly what the Illuminati, the French Revolution, and what Marx wanted to do. And it weakened the British Empire. Didn't destroy it, but it weakened it. World War I. And then you had the League of Nations, which was the beginning of world-ruling government. But it, was, it failed, and it set the seeds for World War uh, II with, the, with the, um, the, the imposition of of reparations on Germany, which sowed the seeds and set the way for World War II, which I believe was totally planned. And then World War II then gave us the United Nations, the common market, the European Union, and on and on and on. That's a whole other discussion. I made a video about that recently. So that was in 1907. That was the League of Nations came about after World War I. Then you had the Council on Foreign Relations, which was founded in 1921 and the Rockefellers and all these big global elites and powerful people were involved in that. And that was to bring world leaders together to basically begin to implement the, the ideas of world government. Then in 1933, you had the Humanist Manifesto that came out. Human, Humanist Manifesto, it was published by some of the, the, the world's, especially the U.S. leading educators, ideologues, professors, philosophers, authors, and these kind of people, very influential people, including John Dewey, who was the modern, who was the, who was the father of modern American education. And the Humanist Manifesto is the title of three manifestos laying out humanist, the, a humanist worldview. They are the original Humanist Manifesto, 1933, also called the Humanist Manifesto 1, the Humanist Manifesto of, of uh, 2, published in 1973, and the Humanist Manifesto 3, um, published in 2003. Uh, the, the manifesto originally arose from religious humanism. The first manifesto entitled uh, simply a Humanist Manifesto was written in 1933 primarily by and they would list some names, and was published with 34 signatories, including philosopher John Dewey. Unlike the later ones, um, the first manifesto talked of a new religion and referred to humanism as a religious movement to transcend and replace previous religions based on allegations of supernatural revelation. The document outlines a 15-point belief system which, in addition to secular outlook, opposes acquisitive acquisitive and profit-motivated society, basically a socialistic Marxist society where nobody owns anything. Have you heard that recently? You By 2030, you will own nothing and you will be happy. Have you heard that? That was a direct quote from Klaus Schwab, founder of the World Economic Forum, disciple of Henry Kissinger, who was a disciple of David Rockefeller and et al., and Klaus Schwab, the founder of the World Economic Forum, or the Davos, where all the world's elite presidents and leaders, industrial leaders, and, and, and other type people gather every year in Davos, Switzerland, in the wintertime. That's what he said. This is a repeat of the same stuff, guys. That's a re What they're repeating is Marx. And I could take you to the book of Revelation. If you don't 
Get the mark of the beast you cannot buy and sell. In other words, you can't own anything you can't operate. Okay. The document, the Humanist Manifesto 1, outlines a 15-point system which, in addition to a secular outlook, opposes acquisitive and profit-motivated society and outlines a world egalitarian society based on voluntary mutual cooperation. Oh, yeah, right. If you don't buy and sell, if you don't get the COVID passport, you're out of here. Nothing voluntary about it. Initially, yeah, but eventually, no. Uh, voluntary mutual cooperation language was ha was considerably softened by the humanist board owners of the document 20 years later. Okay, so what are their what are their main points? I'm not going to read. I've actually got the text of it here. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But number one, there's no god. They're atheists. They believe in evolution. No life after death. Belief in moral relativism. In other words, you can make up your own rules. Instead of thy will be done, it's do as thou wilt. If it feels good, to quote the Hebrew, the hippie mantra, if it feels good, do it. The do what thou wilt is the, the mantra of people like Aleister Crowley, the Satanist. Do what thou wilt, which is a perversion of the words of Yeshua, thy will be done. The, from, from, the, from the Lord's Prayer and what he said in the Garden of Gethsemane. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but thine be done. He's in his prayer to the Father. So this is the devil's response to that. So belief in moral, moral relativism. In other words, there is no standard of morality. There's no, no, no laws from the Creator written with his finger in stone. You make it up as you go. Rejection of divine immutable truth, or i.e. biblical values. Rejection of all religious values and systems. They want all religion gone. They want their religion, actually. The concept of religion is defined in a humanistic and secular sense. Belief in human potential as man's only hope. In other words, we can solve all of our own problems. We don't need outside intervention. No belief. Uh, religion is egocentric and is simply defined as subjective inner well-being based on the subjective emotions of each individual, not based on divine revelation or biblically, basically biblical values. There's no belief in the supernatural. Man alone sets his own course for his social betterment. The sole meaning and purpose of life and the way to find satisfaction is, to, is apart from religion and involves man creatively finding satisfaction through his own achievements. New world of secularism has no place in it for any religious tradition. Belief in a Marxist type socialism, no property, anti-capitalism, a government controlled economy, shared life in a shared world. Pure socialism, pure communism. Promises the betterment of good of all, uh, betterment of and good life for all humans. Oh yeah, don't you know? It will make you It'll, you, you, will, you will have no property, no worries. Everything will be provided for you. you. You will own nothing. You will not have any responsibility. You'll be given a guaranteed social income. The check will come to you in the mail every week. You don't have to lift a finger. You don't have to do anything. You can be a lazy bum and sit at home and do nothing. You don't have to work or so. Work very little. And, you know, you can just sit there in your little virtual reality uh, world and do little or nothing. Robots will take care of it. Everything will come to you, etc., 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 etc. And you know how many people will fall for that? You know how many people are already falling for it? You know how many people I know who are customers of mine who have a government disability and yet are perfectly able-bodied to go out and work? And they're living off of my hard-earned tax dollars. The Bible says, thou shalt work six days. And if a man does not provide for his household, he is worse, denied the faith, and is worse than an infidel. That's Torah. And these guys are coming against it, and they've got a whole bunch of people that have bought into this, and they think they don't have to work. And they can just sit around and not work. I've been working every day of my life since I was 13. I started my business when I was 13. That was over almost 50 years ago, and I'm still working. 
And I'm going to keep working because I'm not a loafer and I don't sponge off of other people. I provide for my family. But this is these, these guys cater to the laziness in human beings to want to sponge off of other people. And Yah's against that, and I'm against that. And I will not back down from that. To the degree that you have the ability and the knowledge and the physical capabilities to do that, you need to be working. One way or the other. And if even when you're retired, there's still things you can do. Use your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding to help people. I have clients, they spend all day on the freaking golf course. When they should be using their wisdom and their talents and their abilities to help people. Yeah, I'm not against golfing and you've worked hard. Enjoy your life. But get out there and volunteer and help. Help your grandkids, whatever. And there's a lot of people that do that. And God bless those. So this world of this idea of a, a utopia is a hellhole from the pit of hell. And you look at any communist or socialistic country in the world today, and you will see it. Okay. There's no example where any of this kind of thing has worked. Oh, but Bernie Sanders has a better idea. Obama, Pelosi, Schumer, the, the Biden, Hillary Clinton... They all have a better idea. They think their, their idea of utopia is going to be better. No, it's a hellhole, and they're demon, demonized. They're God-hating, spirit of Antichrist demoniacs, all of them. Marx, Zuckerberg, Musk, Bezos, um, Gates, Klaus Schwab, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, Adam Weishaupt, the, the Rosicrucians, Nimrod, Cain, the serpent in the tree, and we could list a lot of others too. It's all out of the same thing. You know, I did a study this week on the synagogue of Satan. I'm not ready to give that study yet. But those who call themselves Jews but are not, but they're of the synagogue of Satan. Look, I love the Jews. They're my brothers. When I was in Israel, I wanted to pick up, I wanted to join the IDF, and I wanted to pick up a gun and help defend, defend our homeland. And Yah bless our brothers who are in there doing it. But there's a lot of wicked Jewish people behind the scenes and non-Jewish people. Rockefeller was not Jewish. Carnegie was not Jewish. Ford was not Jewish. Gates is not Jewish. I don't think Bezos and Elon Musk is not Jewish. And there are a lot of evil people. But there's a lot of Jewish people. And they're at the forefront of these things. Just like Judas was at the forefront of betraying Yeshua. Yeah. The people that should know better are some of the worst ones to help lead the spirit of Antichrist. And I believe that Antichrist will be a Jewish person. It makes sense. But I'm not anti-Jewish. I'm anti-Antichrist, regardless of their um, ethnic origins. But wicked Jewish people have been at the head. Marx was Jewish. Freud was Jewish. The leaders of the, the, leaders of the Russian Revolution were Jewish. Or some of them were. Trotsky, Zelensky, and we could go on. Some people think that Lenin might have been. We don't know. It goes on and on and on. Not Zelensky. Um, Saransky. Zelensky is the president of uh, Ukraine. He's Jewish too. There's another one. It goes on and on and on. Soros. We can list the name. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, she was the head of Planned Parenthood for years, the chief leading or the lead counsel. I mean, and almost all the people in Hollywood, all the movers and shakers have all been Jewish, the original people. You know, the, and the, the, the people that control, that own the New York Times, that started NBC and AB, I don't know ABC, but CBS, they were all Jewish. And, they, and, and the Washington Post, not now, but then, back in the 30s and 40s and 50s and all the way up. The control of the information. Okay? There, I said it. 
Now, Yeshua was Jewish also. He was a good Jew. And there's bad people of all ethnic origins, but Yah, Satan has gotten behind many Jewish people who are so gifted and talented, and you know most of them have won the, a large percentage have won Nobel prizes in everything. I mean, they are a gifted race. That's why Yeshua came from them, um, and they were leaders, line of the tribe of Judah, and and they were you know kings and so forth. But boy, when they go bad, they go bad. Okay, I'm not going to say any more about that. Um, it's really, it's really sick, and we got to recognize this. Those who are of the synagogue of Satan say they are Jews or not. As the Book of Romans, Paul, the Jew, says in Romans, not all who are Jews are Jews. Not all are from the seed of Abraham. Okay, maybe we'll talk about that someday. But the bottom line. The Jews that believe in Yeshua and the Jews that are not part of that, they're our brothers. And we pray that they all come to Yeshua. And the tribe of Judah is an awesome tribe. And, 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 and when they come to see the light and they wake up and see their Jewish Messiah, wow, it's going to be an awesome thing. But the rest of them, those that are of the Antichrist, Yah will deal with them. Okay, so as I mentioned, that there are uh, some, some people who... Who have been really prescient? They've been. They've seen things in the future, um, uh, and many of them are, are the um, founders of the uh, science fiction movement. I'm going to give you a few examples. H.G. Wells, uh, he's the one that wrote the War of the Worlds. He was a probably the father of modern fiction, but he was a futurist. He was very prescient, and in in um, in um, 1928 he wrote a book called The Open Conspiracy. You can still buy it. It was published in 1928 by H.G. Wells when he was 62 years old. The book is in his own words, in his own words, quote, uh, words is a scheme to thrust forward and establish a human control over the destinies of life and liberate it from its present dangers, uncertainties, and miseries, end quote. It propounds that as a result of scientific progress or technocracy or technology, a common vision of world of a world quote politically, so, socially, and economically unified end quote is developing among educated and the elites, and this notion can be the starting point for quote a world revolution aiming at universal peace, welfare, and happy activity end quote, resulting in the development of development of quote a world common wheel or commonwealth end quote. This description may be from. Another edition of this product. Okay. Then H.G. Wells, uh, around the same era, wrote a book called A Modern Utopia, where two travelers fall into a space warp and suddenly find themselves upon a utopian Earth controlled by a single world government. For more than 70 years, Penguin has been, the publishing house, has been the leading publisher of Okay, I'm sorry. It goes on and on. It talks about that. I don't want to... Okay. I, I should delete that part. <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with it. And then... Um, um, another... Um, this book, The New World Order, uh, which um, we, read, we talked about previously, um, proposes a framework of international functionalism. This is another kind of an overview of it. Uh, promotes or proposes a framework of international functionalism that could guide the world towards achieving world peace. To achieve these ends, Wells asserts that a socialist and scientifically planned world government would need to be formed to defend human rights. We see this in one way or another uh, predicted in the book of Revelation. I won't go there, but go read Revelation 13, 17, and 19. Okay, next author, Aldous Huxley. In his brave new his book, Brave New World, which was published in 1932, it's a dystopian, or the opposite of utopia, social science fiction, um, written in 1931, published in 1932, largely set in futuristic world state whose citizens are environmentally engineered into an intelligence-based social hierarchy. The novel anticipates 
huge scientific advancements in reproductive technology, sleep learning, psychologi psychological manipulation, and classical conditioning that are combined to make a dystopian society which is challenged by only a single individual. Um, the story's protagonist, uh, Huxley followed this book with a, a reus... Anyway, um, anyway, I won't go into that. Uh, the term transhumanism was coined by Aldous Huxley's brother, who is Julius Huxley, who was the evolutionary biologist and first director of general of the United Nations, UNESCO. Uh, uh, what is UNESCO? United Nations Educational Social something, or I forget what it stands for. But anyway, um, Julian Huxley said, quote, this is Aldous Huxley's brother, I believe in transhumanism. Once there are enough people who can truly say that, that the human species will be on the threshold of a new kind of existence as, a different, as different from ours as ours is from the Peking man, it will, be, it will at least be consciously fulfilling its destiny, end quote. This was written back, I don't know when it was, in the 50s. Now, the United Nations was formed in 1946, right after World War II. Won't get into that. Um, that, was, that was the beginning of world government. In George Orwell, in, 1980, in 1948, he published the book 1984, which some of us have read. 1984 is a dystopian social science fiction novel and cautionary tale written by George Orwell. Uh, thematically, it centers on the consequences of totalitarianism, mass surveillance, repressive regimentation of society, and behaviors within society. It's a de democratic socialistic model of the totalitarian government in the, um, in the, and in the novel, and it's, it's patterned after a, a Stalinist Russia and Nazi Germany. Uh, more broadly, the novel examines the role of truth and facts within politics and the ways in which they are manipulated. Boy, haven't we seen that. In fact, just in the last week or two, the Biden government, the Biden administration has come out with um, some um, uh, under the Homeland Security and now one other branch. I forgot what they are. They are coming out with what they call a, um, well, the critics are called the Ministry of Truth, which is a, a term from George Orwell's book. But basically, it's it's a fact checking agency or or branch to to counter and to contradict or to set the record straight if 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 information is being put out there that is contrary to the government narrative. Our taxpayer taxpayer dollars are funding um, these propaganda machines, okay? Uh, let's call it for what it is. You can go read about that. That's happening as we speak. Um, yeah, uh, more on, on the book 1984. Um, it talks about when much of the world has fallen victim to perpetual war, omnipresent government surveillance, historical um, negationism, and propaganda. Anyway, uh, we won't read any more on that. Um, uh, 1984 has become a classic literary example of political and dystopian fiction. It has also popularized the term Orwellian as an adjective which, with many terms used in, in the novel, entering common usage, including Big Brother, Doublethink, Thought Police, Thought Crimes, Newspeak, 2 plus 2 equals 5, and so forth and so on. In 1973, the Trilateral Commission, which was the um, kind of the stepchild of the Council on Foreign Relations from 1921, was established by David Rockefeller. Now, it was trilateral, means three-sided, and it was to uh, facilitate commerce between uh, North America, basically America and Canada, Europe, and Japan. And, uh, and, but that became, um, a, a basis for, uh, the global, um, business and government elites to come together to promote trade and, 
to to um, amalgamate banking and industry and all this and free trade and this kind of thing, economics. So, in conclusion, the Humanist Manifesto came out also. Uh, number two came out in 1973. And basically, I'm not going to read through all this except to point out a couple things. It basically was a reiteration of the Humanist Manifesto Chapter 1, or Number 1 of 1933, but it added some additional things. And the things that it added was, scroll down here on my notes, full sexual expression between consenting adults, including abortion. So total se um, sexual libertinism and f full sexual expression. And you've heard about that. Anything is legal as long and is acceptable as long as it's between consenting adults. We've heard this again and again. And then the promotion of democracy. You've heard all of this going back. Well, World War I was sold to the United States as making the world safe for democracy. And that was a... That was a term that was come that was promoted by Edward Bernays, who was the double cousin or double nephew. I forget which one. I think it was double cousin of Sigmund Freud, the father of modern psychology. But Edmund Edmund Bernays is the is the um, father of modern advertising and marketing and brainwashing. And he came up with this idea to help Woodrow Wilson, uh, who was who promised the American people as he was getting um, go, running for his, his second term of president um, of the United States that he would they would not go to war in World War One. He promised the American people and on that basis of that lie he was elected and then Theodore Roosevelt got in there split the Republican Party he was part of the global elite also split, split the Republican Party when he formed the Bull Moose Party and that allowed um, Woodrow Wilson to win, and then Woodrow Wilson, uh, who was a New World Order guy, he's the one during his presidency that the Federal Reserve and and the graduated income, income tax was brought on. Uh, anyway, that's a whole other discussion. Anyway, but Edward Bernays is the one that came up with making the world safer to democracy. Now, the United States is not a democracy. It's a democratic republic. And a republic is very different than democracy. Democracy is basically mob rule, guys. Democracy means, it, it sounds so good. It means, you know, power to the people. It means that people get a chance to, to choose who their president, who their representatives will be, and choose what the laws will be. But what they don't tell you is, The, the people in charge of the government, if the people, the young people, are educated and brainwashed through a mandatory educational, public funded educational system, then guess what? The kids will be told what to think, and then they will know how to vote. And they will be vote, they will vote in the things that they are brainwashed to believe. Remember, the USSR, Union of Soviet Socialistic Republic. Yeah, it was based on democracy. They didn't use the word democracy in there. They used the word republic. In this case, the communist manifesto and the constitution of the Soviet system was what ruled. I believe that uh, Germany, East Germany was called the Democratic Republic DDR, Democratic Republic of East Germany. I think that North Korea is also called a democracy. This whole word democracy is thrown around and you hear the leftist politicians constantly, we've got to make this country a democracy and this and, this and that. It's so they can get in there, brainwash the people and get their people into power. Okay, I, I, basically... Lex Rex versus Rex Lex. There's some Latin for you. The Bible is a constitutional monarchy with the Torah as the constitution. The Torah is the law. That's the kind of system the Bible promotes. Um, the Davidic kingdom was a constitutional monarchy. It was a 
king who was under the rulership of the Constitution, which was Torah. The United States was established as a constitutional monarchy, I mean as a, a, a constitutional republic, under the rule of the Constitution, and the Constitution was the, the, was the king. Lex, um, Rex Lex, in other words, the king rules. Rex in, in Latin means king, Lex means the law. Um, so when you say Lex Rex, the law rules. Whereas in Rex Lex, the king rules. That is, the king makes all the rules. And the socialistic, democratic, socialistic, socialistic model tells us that the people are the king. But if the people can be manipulated to believe what the social engineers want them to believe and can be brainwashed, now the social engineers are really the king while making the people look like the king or making them feel like the king and giving them government handouts to vote for them. You see, that's the, gov that's the, that's the Democratic Party mantra in America. That's what it boils down to. They buy their votes and the vinyl Republicans buy their votes by bribing the people. And there's no end to this. Okay, I haven't articulated this very well. Hopefully the idea came through. This is not the biblical model, but this is what the New World Order crowd promotes to draw the people in to this false utopian paradise that they promised to create. The problem is that the devil always over-promises and under-delivers. And it's a way to trap the people into the, what I have been call, saying for years, neo-feudalism. You had the feudalistic system of the, of, of, of the uh, Middle Ages, where the, where the ruling elite, the kings and the lords and the monarchy ruled, and the people lived on their land that they don't, didn't own, and they were serfs. Guys, that's what they're going, we're going back to, except... The, these these ideologues do not want revolt on their hand. So they're going to give people a guaranteed income each month. They're going to give them, this is what they're proposing, they're going to give them basic essentials and keep them fat, dumb, and happy. This is back to the brave new world idea of, of Aldous Huxley. And keep the people dumbed down so that they love it and they don't even know that the, under the under the under the guise of convenience, of not having to work, or not having to work very much, of long vacations, of extended vacations for maternity leaves, and not having to do this, and not having to do this, and that, and the government taking care of you. Now you can have all that you want and not work very hard for it. And I believe that that's where we're headed, and that's what the Book of Revelation says: that they are going to dumb people down through drugs to put getting people in altered states of consciousness and by their sorceries they make slaves out of men go read revelation 18 and they um people through oligarch not free enterprise small business capitalism like i'm involved in but through oligarchy capitalism it says in revelation 18 the leaders the merchants are the great men of the earth they we're talking about the big, the Silicon Valleys, the big chemical, petrol, chemical companies, the big social media companies, the pharmaceutical companies. These are the people that are buying up the agribusinesses that are buying up all the land. And, and, you know, we could go on and on and on. And then the um, agglomeration of people into small living areas. That's why what Brother Dave is doing is good, getting people on the land, getting out away from government control, where you can be self-sufficient. Okay, you get the picture here. Um, they believe, the, 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 the secular humanist number three believes in separation of church and state. It's not about separation of church and state, guys. It's about elimination of all religious influence totally. Prior out of school. Now they don't even want you to have a moment of silence. Taking out in God we trust, taking down the Pledge of Allegiance that says one nation under God, elimination of everything, Bible clubs in schools, starting Satanist clubs in schools, 
They hate God and they hate religion. Removing crosses in, from public places, the Ten Commandments, on and on and on it goes. They also promote socialism over capitalism and, and over free enterprise. Again, Humanist Manifesto 3. Abolition of nationalism in favor of globalism and world community. That means destroying the borders. Oh yeah, we can protect the border of Ukraine, but we open up our border wide to the sinking lifeboat called United States of America. Guys, what's going on in Ukraine is not about um, at all about um, um, national sovereignty or borders. That's what we're being lied to. It's much more than that. It's about people making a lot of money off of arms. And it's about, in other words, Americans, because we're funding them. And it's about establishing, it's about food shortages, famines, which the Bible also predicts. Fertilizer shortages, so you can't have food. It's about... If you don't follow what we tell you to do, we're going to destroy your economy. And so that we can establish a new kind of economy, global currency, cryptocurrency, digital currency with social credit scores like they're already trying in Japan, in China. This is what this is all about. And it falls right on the heels of COVID where people are beginning to think along certain lines and it's good for, it's for your good to be quarantined and to not go to church and to not speak out and six foot distancing 666 all over the floor getting people programmed guys there's a lot of stuff going on here and i'm just skimming over the top of the waves see behind the curtain and it's all in the book of Re well a lot of this is in the book of revelation and then the humanist manifesto three Proposes a world community governed by the state. It's the rise of statism. When, there, when statism, the worship of the state, and Francis Schaeffer talked about this in his books called The, the uh, Christian Manifesto and some of his other books that he wrote uh, in the 70s and 80s. Go read them. He, he predicted this, some of these things. Um, a brilliant thinker. But when people... They've got to get rid of religion and they've got to make the state God because the state knows what's best. The state will provide for you. The state will heal you when you're sick. The state will take care of you when you're old. The state will meet all of your needs. The state knows what's best. They will tell you what to do, where to go, who to you know, talk to, what you can and cannot say. And, and they'll take away your freedom and your liberty in the name of Safety and security and peace. And you become a serf and you own nothing and you will love it. Now, in conclusion. Oh, yeah, here's another one. Elimination of national boundaries must be national boundaries must be eliminated and no travel restrictions for people moving from one country to another. Look at the southern border of the United States. This was proposed in 2003. Now. In conclusion, the UN, 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 United Nations Global Agenda, Global Agenda 2021 and Global Agenda 2030. Go look it up on the internet. Type those in, Global Agenda 2021 and 2030. This is what the United Nations, the Davos crowd, and all of these guys want and are planning and are trying to implement for you and for me. I'll go through this list real quickly and it will be done. Number one, this is their missions and goals. One world government, one world cashless currency, one world central bank, one world military, the end of national sovereignty, the end of all private, privately owned property, the end of the family unit, depopulation, control of population growth and population density. Mandatory multiple vaccines, universal basic income, and the movement toward austerity. In other words, we're all going to be made equally poor. Implementation of a world social credit system like China has. Trillions of 
appliances hooked into the 5G or 6G monitoring system called the Internet of All Things. Government raised children. Government owned and controlled schools, colleges, and universities. The end of private transportation, owning cars, etc. All businesses owned by government and or corporations. The restrictions of non-essential air travel. Human beings concentrated into human settlements, zones, or cities. Why do you think our cities have been, come hell or high water, have been spending billions of dollars putting in mass transit systems that nobody rides? We've got them right here in our own town. And you look at them, there's only a few people on them. And they all go into the city as people are moving out of the city, trying to get in the country. You know what I'm talking about. Light rail, urban transit. I'm not talking about buses. I'm talking about these, you know, the trolleys and the light rail and this kind of thing. All over the United States. You know, it works pretty well in Europe. I lived in Europe for a year. It works pretty well in Europe because Europe is very small. You can get around places pretty quickly. But the United States has vast, large territories. It's hard to get from one place to another. You need automobiles. The end of irrigation. Yeah, I guess water. Watering your lawn. You're going to have dead lawns, folks. The end of private farms and grazing livestock. The end of single-family homes. Restricted land use that serves human needs. The ban of natural, non-synthetic synthetic drugs and naturopathic medicines. Guys, what is the answer? Like I told my client the other day, on the street, outside the job, when we were discussing not all of these things, but a couple of things that are going on, I said, there's a one-word answer. He looked at me like, really? I said, the one-word answer is Yeshua, Jesus. That's our only hope. And that's the only hope we need. And we've got to come to the point where we live under the blood of the Lamb. We love not our lives unto death. And, and we overcome him by the blood, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, Revelation 12, 11, and follow the Lamb wherever he goes, as it says a little bit later in that passage. And in the meanwhile, prepare. Prepare yourself physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and every other way you know. Because it's going to be a wild ride. But I'll tell you something. What's coming is our only hope. And that's the thing. We have a glorious hope. And we must not be overcome by fear, but overcome fear with love. Perfect love casts out fear. And where there is fear, there is torment. But we have Yeshua. He has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And when you start to be overwhelmed by all of these things that are going on, it's time to take your eyes off the storm cloud and get your eyes back on Yeshua. As you step out of the boat of security and of your little lifestyle the way it's been and start walking on that water, walking over the top of it all with your eyes on Yeshua and he will lead us where we need to go, what we need to do. And I'm speaking to myself as well because the Bible says that because of these things, the hearts of many people will be overcome by fear. Only Yeshua, only the solid rock of his word and his truth will carry us through this. And guess what? If they kill us, we're promoted. If we die, we're promoted. Because of Elohim before us, who can be against us? We are more than conquerors through Yeshua. And we need to encourage us, each other, with these words. I don't want this to be a message of, of despair or hopelessness, a message of hope. But we must not be ignorant. If we're ignorant then we're not going to be, if we're not forewarned, we will not be forearmed. So share this message with others. And if you're not sure what to think, pray about it, read the Bible, and hopefully I've given you something to think about. May Yeshua's name be glorified. Hallelujah. Amen.